I'm glad you could join us as we continue to study real Jesus, the real Jesus of history. You know, in the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, we're introduced early on to a central character named Aslan. He's a lion whose sacrifice ends up saving the whole world. Now, in the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we see how this mighty and powerful lion communicates almost wordlessly with the Pevensey children who find solace and comfort bearing in their hands in his mane, even while flinching while looking into his terrible and yet kind eyes. He's a character that any child can relate to, uh, yet at the same time, one who can never fully be understood. In Narnia, Aslan is a character, it seems, that resists these neat packaged characterizations. Now, closer to home in our world, if anyone resists neat packaged characterizations, it's Jesus. Only those of us who know and love Christ understand how it is possible for us to find solace in him and at the same time flinch at his majesty, to find both comfort and challenge in his words and to love and fear him all at once. The aspects of Aslan that captivated us as children are the magnetic qualities that I think draw us to Jesus today. Now, as we jump back into this series from Mark, we'll be looking at the real Jesus of history as revealed in the gospel. And as we do, we'll discover that Jesus is not predictable, yet trustworthy. He is sometimes surprising in what he says or does, and yet he's deeply meaningful and purposeful in every move and every single word. This evening, we're going to explore him cutting against the norm when, when choosing who he chooses for his team to go on mission, a mission that will eventually turn the world and, by the way, continues to turn the world upside down. Now, when you or I choose a team, we naturally look at and uh, for the very best, the most talented or the smartest people or the most talented people to join our team. But one of the most amazing markers of the ministry of Jesus is the type of men that he chose to be his disciples on his team. He chose a small group of confused, unqualified, and unknown men to walk with him. And even one of them betrayed him to death. And he chose them on purpose to be the leaders of his mission to make himself known in the world. Yet in spite of their weaknesses and in spite of the fact that they were quite simply just ordinary guys, Jesus picks them for his starting lineup on his mission engaging, people transforming, history changing teams. Now, LifeBridge isn't a church with a lot of political clout. We don't have very many social influencers. Nobody at our church that I know of is of direct noble birth. And by the way, speaking of noble, I don't know if anyone has or even will win a Nobel Prize. The bottom line is that we are a church of relatively normal, average, common people. And you know what? That's not a bad thing. It's just an it is what it is thing. But what my point is in pointing out the obvious is that if Jesus can use the common average guys that he chose as his first disciples and in three years transforms them into a team that through the power of the Holy Spirit turns the world upside down for his glory, then that means then that he can certainly use us too. And that gives me great hope today about trusting God to do great things in us and through us here at LifeBridge as we trust him to go out on his mission. Well, let's start by looking at verse 7 of, of uh, Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 6. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Now, let's just stop there for a moment. The first thing I want to point out is that a disciple uh, really should expect to be sent. Now, Jesus came on mission. He lived on mission. He died on mission and left his disciples, including all of us who follow him today, on mission. And that's because we're not saved to be saved, but saved to be sent. We're saved to go out into the world for the glory of our Jesus to make him known as our Lord, Savior, and our greatest treasure. So once a disciple is called to be a disciple of Jesus, the disciple needs to expect to be sent. In fact, you might remember back in Mark chapter 3, 14, that he appointed 12, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out. That's the purpose, to send them out. The reality is that following Jesus always involves a call to be with him and a call to go out. 
Now, he calls all of us to be with him because it's, it's by being with Jesus in prayer and through his word and in community with other Christians by abiding in the vine that we experience his presence and hear his instruction and we receive his love. But the, he then sends us out in order to serve others and meet their needs, which is always ultimately, by the way, the need of a savior, so that they can be with him and then be sent out to do the same thing themselves. Listen, church. Jesus never planned to save us in order for us to sit forever in some kind of personal, private, spiritual retreat. This is why those who think that they can uh, just be hanging out with Jesus without ever making disciples themselves will ultimately grow stale in their spiritual lives. We, we can't do that. We can't hoard Jesus' love for ourselves. We have to pass his love on to others or it's going to go flat and stale in our heart. So expect to be sent. But I want you to notice something else about the sending. They were also sent out two by two. I mean, just imagine, how would you have liked to have been Judas, Judas Iscariot's partner? Uh, hey, Judas, um, why are you so quiet? Is there something on your mind? I don't know, but, but you know what? Anyways, individually, they could have covered more territory uh, on their own, but Jesus doesn't do things by guessing by golly. There, there are a few reasons Jesus would have sent them out this way. Now, one reason was that it would have provided the disciples with a, a form of team support so that they could encourage each other to keep moving on and to hold each other accountable when needed. There's something to be said about working on a team with others that just helps spur us on, doesn't it? But another reason was the deep bond that would have taken place that would have absolutely been needed later for when they faced hostile opposition in the establishment of the church. In fact, the term band of brothers comes to mind. Men and women who have been through battles or tough times together will often build strong bonds of friendship that will last entire lifetimes and will sometimes even go deeper than family relationships. Road trips can have this effect too. I'll never forget one of my road trips taken with friends during my college years. One in particular, in fact, stands out. There were five of us and we were sitting together eating at McDonald's in Vancouver. It was a February evening. It was back in 1985. When one of my buddies said the famous words, Hey, we should go to Edmonton tonight. Now, now you got to understand, Vancouver to Edmonton is a 2,400 kilometer, 25 hour round trip. Now, of course, we all said, yeah. I mean, but you know what happened? That trip resulted in two unplanned overnight stays, a busted timing chain replacement done halfway home on my car, and a frozen car battery in minus 35 degree temperatures while we were in Edmonton. But you know what? Deeper friendships have continued to this very day because of that road trip experience. Jesus sent these guys on their own personal road trip and through that created a deeper, richer, bolder, stronger bond of friendship and brotherhood than they ever would have uh, thought possible. As we look further into the stories of the Gospels and particularly the book of Acts, we see that this road trip method of partnering has been the normative practice. Just look at the missionary journeys of Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Silas, Barnabas and Mark. We need each other. Accountability partners, encouragers, small community, life groups, triads, where care can be shared and expressed for each other. But not only did Jesus send them out supported by a team, we see in verse 7 that he also sent them with authority. That authority is another way of saying that they received the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, when Jesus sends somebody on mission, he also gives them the power to carry out the mission. I read an article a few years back that stated, this is a U.S. article, that more than 20,000 people went to the ER that year with high anxiety and rapid heartbeat and seizures or heart attacks after downing these uh, energy drinks. More than half the patients had negative reactions to the drinks alone, which include drinks like Monster and Red Bull and Rockstar, that kind of thing. While others experience trouble after combining these same drinks with alcohol or prescription drugs, usually stimulants. Now, why do these people do what they did? Often people do what they do because of feelings of inadequacies to live life or parent well or perform at work or at school or look good in front of others. We're all looking for power and energy, for an edge. But true power, pure power comes from God's spirit. When it comes to the mission God has called us to, we might feel inadequate for the task. We might be weak in our words and we might feel that our testimony lacks real power. In fact, my testimony might even be a dud. 
some of us might be thinking. But Jesus has promised to give us his power, his authority. And his power and his authority never produces duds. In fact, let me just say that we are inadequate and too weak on our own testimonies. And they do lack power because this is all about a divine mission way beyond uh, our human capabilities. So that should drive us to relying on Jesus instead of relying on our own strength or trying to discover the next best best method or power booster apart from Jesus. We need to recognize and embrace the fact that because Jesus has sent us on mission, God's power rests in us and on us already, which leads us to the second point. Because he has sent us on mission with authority, we can trust God to provide. Let's take a look at verses 8 to 9 now. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. So here they're told to take nothing except the, the basics for, with them for their journey. The idea here is that they were to undertake this assignment with a full faith in God and in his ability to take care of them, not in their amazing detailed planning and strategies. We see this expressed in the Lord's Prayer, don't we? Give us this day our daily bread. The most obvious meaning of that request is that it's God who's going to look after us. He's our provider and we rely on Him to meet our daily needs. We trust God to provide as we align our lives according to His will. And as we do, we don't need to live angst-driven lives anymore because we're not putting the faith in ourselves or in our own planning. Rather, we can put our faith completely in Him to provide just what we need when we need it for every area of our lives. Now, does that mean that we don't plan at all? Well, of course we plan, but we plan the way children plan for a family trip. Now, when our kids were small and we'd go out for a vacation, Debbie and I would plan the big stuff, the important details, uh, things like the overall budget, the hotel stays, the location of the gas stops, the restaurants and the food packed in the cooler for the, bit, for the long haul, and of course, for my supply of Coke Zero. I mean, you know, the big stuff. The kids trusted us for all of that. However, they planned too. They planned about what book they'd bring along, what uh, toy they'd they'd bring, uh, what music they'd listen to. They even helped plan some of the bigger stuff, like what hike we'd go on and occasionally what restaurant we'd go to, as long as it wasn't the same one every single day. But for the main decisions, they didn't need to be in charge of the planning. They trusted mom and dad to plan it out, and they were quite happy to depend on us and trust in our ability to supply their needs. You know what? God engages us in his plan. However, he also wants us to walk in dependence on him to supply our needs. You you, you might remember Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Listen, if Jesus sends us out, we can trust him to take care of us. So let's give up on us trying to be in charge of the planning. There is also the idea here in 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 these verses here of urgency. Jesus wants them to go now. I mean, the fields were white with the harvest, and it was time to go. Uh, They were to have their go bags ready. Uh, Do you know what a go bag is, by the way? When Debbie was near her due date with the kids, we had a go bag already packed and ready with her essentials. When the stork came knocking, we didn't have time to pack the bag. I mean, what slippers should I bring, do you think? Hmm, should I bring the blue house coat or the other blue house coat? I, I just can't decide. I mean, there wasn't time to debate the various degrees of importance regarding the weight and the feel of a particular pair of socks at that moment. We made sure everything was ready because when the time came, we had to pick up and go. There was an urgency to get her to the hospital on time for obvious reasons. Likewise, there is an uh, an urgency that comes with the gospel message. The time to go and tell the world is now, it's today. And we get our gospel go bags ready by being in the word regularly spending time in prayer, hanging out with God's people and community and learning to disciple others in the process. In other words, knowing Jesus, loving others and making disciples. But also in the verses here, we see that even as they urgently go, they're to go humbly. And we see that expressed in that they were to take only one tunic or or one coat. Now in that day, it was usually just the rich who could afford two coats to, to begin with. And Jesus was sending them out as common men into a world of common people. They were not to put on airs and come across as though they were better than the people that they encountered. And I think there's a lesson in that for us too. Sometimes we Christians, collectively anyways, can come across like we are better than the world around us. Now often unfairly, though sometimes 
maybe fairly, we have been accused of looking down our self-righteous noses at others and talking about how much better we are than they are. Now, the truth is that the only thing that separates us from the worst sinner in the world is the pure grace of God. So we should love the world sacrificially like Jesus, so much so that some of the same ones who accuse us of thinking that we're better than everybody else or allege that we are just a bunch of do-gooders who have our religious noses stuck up in the air, parading around, acting like we're something special, would have a change of heart and mind because they see, instead of self-righteousness, the amazing beauty of Jesus and how we live and act and love. And by the way, for those who actually do have hearts filled with spiritual pride, remember that there was a time when we were just like the world. You know what? Apart from the blood of Jesus and the grace of God, we still would be. There but for the grace of God go I. Which is why we can and will want to commit to invest in the lives of other people. Let's take a, uh, a look at verses 10 to 11. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. These disciples, as well as us, his disciples today, We'll meet two kinds of people when we go into the world for Jesus. Some will receive us and listen to what we have to say, and others will reject us, cut us off, and close the door. Now, if they listen, Jesus says, don't leave too quickly. Stop, stay, and invest where the Word of God is welcomed. Don't, don't feel the need to move on to another house and another house and then another house or another person and another person and another person. If they'll have you in this gospel, be willing to stay with them a while. That's the meaning behind these words, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. But then he continues by saying, and if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. In other words, don't spend your energies trying to make people hear the good news who don't want to hear the good news. Sometimes we'll do that with family and friends because we so desperately want them to hear what we, what we know. And we want them to hear it so badly, but we can't force people to invite us into that part of their lives. And there comes a time when we move on. Don't force yourself to be given a welcome with open arms. Now, if it happens, great, but if not, then leave. In sales, we had a saying, work with those who want to be worked with and those who don't, don't. And that's what Jesus was saying here when he told his disciples that if hospitality was refused and if the doors uh, doors and the ears were closed, that they were to shake off the dust of that place from their feet when they left. Stay with those who want you to stay and with those who don't, don't. But that does beg a question. Just what does he mean by that shake off the dust comment? Well, in rabbinic law, the dust of a Gentile country was considered defiled. And when a man or a woman entered Palestine from another country, he or she was to shake off every single particle of dust off of the unclean land off of their clothes and off of their shoes and everywhere they could uh, from that foreign nation that they um, had just come from. Shaking it off represented a separation from the pagans and the pollution of their land since the foreign nations weren't part of the Jewish kingdom. They were of a different kingdom. Uh, listen, if they had hand sanitizer back then, I'm sure it would have been made available at every single border crossing. But in this case, Jesus told his guys to do this as a sign for those who rejected the gospel to indicate to these Jewish communities that they weren't part of the new, pure, heavenly kingdom of God that Jesus came to establish. The main point of these two verses is that we need to make room in our day, our month, in our moments to share the gospel with others and then make it a priority to sit with those men and women who receive the good news. Don't be in such a hurry that you can't patiently invest or disciple where God is moving in their ears and hearts of those people around you. We must invest in discipling others who receive the gospel that we share. But also to remember that the gospel doesn't spread through forcing it on others. If people won't receive it, move on to those who are ready to embrace Jesus. And speaking of moving on, the fourth point is that we are to proclaim repentance. Take a look at verses 12 to 13. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. If I went to, uh, around downtown Halifax to let people know that they didn't meet up to my expectations and so they need to repent, how do you think I'd be received? Who cares about your expectations would be the polite version 
of their response, I'm thinking. Who do you think you are might be another polite response. People don't care about my moral code and message of repentance. So it's important to understand that the disciples brought Jesus' message of repentance, not their own. In fact, the word proclaimed is literally the word used when describing a herald's proclamation. When the apostles went out to preach, they didn't create a message, they brought a message. They were the heralds of the king's message. And as heralds, they did not tell people what they believed and what they considered feasible. They told people what Jesus had told them. It was not their opinions they brought, it was God's truth. Now, as heralds of Jesus, they preached that men should repent. By the way, that word repent means a change of mind that leads to a change of action. Clearly, that's a disturbing message to the average person. And it's bound to hurt because it involves the bitter realization that the way we were following is wrong. And that is precisely why so few people actually do repent. I mean, the last thing most people want is to be disturbed. But it's bound to disturb and hurt for that matter because it means a complete reversal of life and a doing something different than what you were doing before in your sin. You know, I'm going to stop doing the things I should not do and I'll begin to do the things I should do. I'm going to stop living a life of sin and I will start to live a life of holiness. We see this principle at play in our everyday lives too. As an example, diets work best when it's not just about stopping the eating, but also when it includes the focus of doing something else, such as exercise. In other words, don't just stop the gossip, but rather begin to intentionally speak words of encouragement. Don't just stop the looking at the porn, begin to fill your mind with the word. There's a story in the novel Quo uh, Vadis that speaks to the power of true repentance. It tells of a love story between a young Christian uh, woman, uh, Lygia, and Marcus, a Roman aristocrat, which takes place in the city of Rome under the rule of Emperor Nero. It was about 64 AD. Marcus is not a Christian, and so Lygia will have nothing to do with him. However, one night he follows her to the secret gathering of the little group of Christians that she's a part of. And there, unknown to anyone, listens to Peter and Peter preach. And as he listens, something begins to happen to him in his heart. In the book, uh, the following describes what happened. He felt that if he wished to follow that teaching, he would have to place on a burning pile all of his thoughts, habits, and character, his whole nature up to that moment and burn them into ashes, and then fill himself with a life completely different, with an entirely new soul. You know what, this is why repentance is such good news, church. When genuine repentance takes place, the change in a person's life is complete, it's radical, it's powerful. Repentance comes up from a heart that is sorry for the wrongs it is guilty of committing, and that sorrow produces a desire to change the way the repentant person has been living. In fact, notice in these verses that we read in Mark's gospel that repentance comes first and then the casting out of demons and the healing. Most people don't like to be told that they were wrong and need to change their lives, but you will never have the blessing of God in your life until you repent of your sins. If you want freedom from bondage, you must repent. If you want freedom from the power of sin, you must repent. Even still, some will not listen as we already talked about. We should expect this in a world uh, enslaved to sin and blind to the beauty of God. Don't be shocked when you hear thanks, but no thanks, or worse. It doesn't mean you're, you've necessarily picked a, a bad time or, or even said it wrong. The gospel is the, is the most offensive news that you could bring, even though it's also the sweetest and most true and most powerful and most hope-filled news that anybody could ever hear. This is the news that says, listen, you are wicked to your very core, broken in every way and destined for unending wrath at the hands of an all-powerful God. And your only hope is in one message and one man, no other, so repent. No wonder the world so often laughs at or screams at Christianity and hates the message that we bring. But remember that it's not our job to be a, a gospel-empowered, divinely sent sales force. Jesus didn't tell the disciples to stay until their audience surrendered. No, he said some will listen and others will not. He's not sending you and me to save souls, but to speak as his representatives. He and he alone is the one who saves and heals and transforms and casts out demons and frees people from addictions and from bondage. In fact, our commission is not to make people hear our message. It's not to create listeners and convert them, but to discover them 
those who hear and repent and make Jesus their Lord, and then, and then after they're discovered, to make disciples of them. Now, we don't know how long the disciples went on this road trip of theirs, but it seems like it, it wasn't long, and there were only 12 of them, just six sets of two. That's smaller than some of our life groups. So how, how much could they have really gotten done? Well, verse 14 says this, that King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. They went out, six pairs of poor, ordinary, untrained, unlikely spokesmen, and what God was doing through them rose to the attention of the highest official in their land. Through their small and simple ministry, Jesus' name became known in that city. Jesus will reveal his fame even through his breadless, bagless, penniless, but faithful followers. And you need to know, church, that God will exalt the name of his son through us as well. The bottom line is that Jesus' name will be known and believed, and he will be made famous in our city too. We just need to expect to be sent, to trust God to provide, to commit to invest in the lives of others, and to proclaim Jesus' life-transforming message of repentance to those who will listen so that they might know Jesus, love others, and in turn make disciples too. But first, let it happen through me. And let it happen through you. And let it happen through LifeBridge.